Good afternoon. Buenas tardes a todos. Here we are for a new conference of the uh, IPARCOS uh, program of conference by Dr. Carolina Casadio. She's going to talk about the search of, for millilenses smile to discriminate between dark matter models. Dr. Casadio, originally from Italy, graduated from the University of Bologna and completed her doctoral studies in Spain in 2016 at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía. The focus of her research has been relativistic jets, inactive galactic nuclei, and their study using very long base interferometry and the multi-wavelength polarimetric data. After the PhD, she moved to the Mass Plan Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn, Germany, where she was a postdoctoral fellow with the VLVA group and where she worked on more, the more challenging millimeter VLVI data. At the beginning of 2020, she moved to Crete to join the research group led by Professor Basiliki ba Paulito and Costas Tassis at the Institute of Astrophysics. Here, here she add a more piece of information to her studies, including the dark matter. She has been recently aware of an, of an IRC a starting ground with the project called SMILE, where she proposed to, research, to search for millilenses to discriminate between dark matter models. Welcome, Dr. Casadio, and it's your turn when you are. Thank you very much. Okay, hope you can see me. So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, this is actually a very good opportunity for me today to present uh, this uh, uh, brand new project uh, called SMILE that uh, we recently started with some uh, uh, collaborators. Some of them are listed here, but there are many more uh, who also participated in, uh, in a pilot study for this project. And um, we... This, uh, uh, this project uh, has been recently awarded uh, of uh, European funding, so uh, we hope to, to carry on some, uh, uh, some good science in the, uh, in the next uh, uh, years. The, the name of the project is SMILES, that stays for uh, Search for Mini Lenses, because in this project we use a, a gravitational lens system in the key but poorly explored milliard second case to uh, search for uh, supermassive compact objects as, uh, for example, uh, um, dark matter uh, halos at subgalactic scales, uh, uh, and then to finally uh, discriminate between dark matter models, as I will show you now. So the, let me start with this uh, plot uh, that tells us uh, how few we know about our universe. Um, Roughly the 95% of the total energy content in the universe is made of unknown forms of uh, energy and matter. And in the standard uh, cosmological model, the uh, lambda CDM model, this matter is in the form of uh, uh, cold dark matter particles, uh, which are rel non relativistic at their origin and which are collisionless. Um, but uh, because of the elusive detection uh, of these particles from one side, on one side, uh, and uh, uh, on the other side, because of the um, difficulties in uh, of, of the lambda CDM model in explaining all the possible scale structure in the universe, on the other side, um, then there are still many viable dark matter models on the on the table of discussion. And actually, some of them have been uh, exactly created to solve these uh, um, lambda CDM paradigm uh, issues. I listed uh, some of them uh, here. Uh, this uh, is not a complete uh, uh, review of dark matter models, so probably these are just the uh, most cited one the mo in, in literature. Uh, here you have the... Um, the self-interacting dark matter model where cold dark matter particles uh, scatter elastically between each other. Uh, then you have uh, the um, cold, dark cold dark matter model where particles are uh, extremely light, that is the fuzzy uh, cold dark matter model. And then you have the well-known uh, warm dark matter model where particles instead are non-relativistic at their origin. 
but dark matter doesn't have to be necessarily a particle. There are, in fact, also other possible candidates, as, for example, primordial black holes. Um, they have, uh, uh, there is a quite uh, wide range of masses, of possible masses for this object, uh, um, because it, uh, um, it, is, uh, it depends on the, um, on the formation time uh, at the very early universe for this, uh, for this object. And uh, recently, actually, there was a new interest uh, in, in this object uh, in connection with the uh, gravitational wave uh, signal 1905-21 that was associated with the merging of two massive black holes where the primary black hole uh, here has uh, uh, had a mass of uh, around 85 solar masses uh, which is in this uh, uh, kind of uh, upper uh, limit for for possible stellar origin so uh, it has uh, raised doubt about its uh, stellar origin. So, as I uh, said before, the lambda CDM model is uh, quite, success uh, quite successful in uh, predicting the formation of uh, larger scale structure in the universe, but it still has uh, some issues, uh, mostly at galactic and subgalactic scales. In particular, at subgalactic scales, uh, it predicts a number of, uh, um, of dark matter halos. Uh, uh, which is far above the observation. Moreover, the density profiles of these dark matter halos at subgalactic scales uh, seem to be different from the predicted ones. And this is what you have in this plot here. Uh, here you have that the, the green point represents uh, the, um, the density profiles of a larger sample of dwarf galaxies from these uh, uh, little things survey here published in OETAL 2015. And as you can see, the green points uh, um, are rising more slowly toward the center of the halo uh, than not the, the gray course that instead uh, represented the prediction from the cold dark matter Navarro Frank and White density profiles. Uh, the, these, uh, uh, these, uh, these, uh, uh, the Navarro Frank and White density profiles. Uh, uh, predict the formation of a high density cusp in the, in the very center of dark matter halos, uh, while instead of these dwarf galaxies uh, seems more to tend to the formation of a, uh, of a core-like uh, center. And, and exactly because of this, uh, this problem is uh, often addressed as the uh, cusp core problem. But it is exactly at this hub-galactic scale so where different dark matter models make very different prediction on the expected number of dark matter halos as well as on their density profiles. In this plot here, you have the power spectrum of baryonic acoustic oscillations for different masses and different scales. And the gray shade area is highlighting exactly this subgalactic scale. If we focus on uh, the blue curves uh, that represent the different dark matter models, we can see that the, um, the solid blue curves uh, that represent the cold dark matter model, instead of the, the dash curve representing the warm dark matter model, they differ between each other, with the warm dark matter model uh, having a cutoff around the 10 to the 8 solar masses which means that if the warm dark matter model is the current one, we shouldn't observe uh, uh, structures in the universe uh, below these uh, around the 10 to the 8 solar masses. So you, you easily understand then how important is estimating the number of dark matter halos at subgalactic scales, because this number can uh, really help us in uh, discerning the nature of dark matter. And so if this is so important, then why uh, this number hasn't been constrained yet? Well, mostly because uh, detecting dark matter halos at subgalactic scales is very difficult. Here on the, on the right, you have a picture showing you um, uh, uh, dwarf galaxies spanning a sixth order of magnitude in stellar masses from the uh, most massive one and, more, and most luminous in the upper left to the less luminous and less massive one at the uh, bottom right. And, uh, uh, and these last ones are only detectable in a, in a small volume around the Milky Way. So you can already see from this picture how 
uh, how difficult it is uh, to observe uh, in, in optical these, uh, uh, these dark matter halos at subgalactic scales. And this is because uh, uh, being smaller and more dark matter dominated, they are extremely faint. Plus, this applies uh, to those dark matter halos uh, that at least can form galaxies, because we don't expect dark matter halos uh, below some in 10 to the 8 solar masses uh, to form galaxies at all. So it means that these objects are dark, and then the only way we have to detect them is uh, through the uh, gravitational effect that they exert on ordinary matter. Therefore, we need the gravitational lensing. And, uh, um, but for a, for a dark matter halo, uh, in order to make strong lensing on a background source, uh, we need this dark matter halo to have a, a surface mass density above a certain threshold. And we can, to some extent, parameterize this, uh, this density with this parameter here uh, that you have on the y-axis, that is the, the concentration parameter. Uh, that tells us how uh, concentrated toward the center is the, is the mass in a dark matter halo. In this uh, recent work of uh, Wang and collaborator uh, in 2020, they, um, they have studied this uh, uh, concentration parameter for a wider number of, uh, uh, of simulated dark matter halos with different masses in function of their mass. And, uh, and one of the results is what you have here is that the, um, the concentration of uh, uh, dark matter halos at subgalactic scales, uh, where the subgalactic scales here is, uh, is delimited by this uh, orange line, the concentration of these dark matter halos is uh, uh, far above, for example, the concentration of uh, uh, galaxy cluster dark matter halos. And then since we know that galaxy cluster as well as galactic halos uh, make strong lensing on background sources, uh, then this implies that at least the, the core of these dark matter halos at subgalactic scales uh, should be able to make strong lensing on background sources. So then, uh, because of their uh, high concentration and uh, small masses, uh, we can approximate these uh, dark matter halos at subgalactic scales uh, with point mass lenses. And from the gravitational lensing theory, we know that a point mass lens uh, um, split the, the image of the source in the, uh, in the background into two lens images whose angular separation, if the lens and the source are at cosmological distances and for order of magnitude precision, it depends only on the mass of the lens. Therefore, if the lens is a compact object with a mass between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 9 solar masses, more or less, I will call from now on this object supermassive compact object. Then we expect the angular separation between the two lens images being in the milliard second regime. And for this reason, we call this gravitational lens system a milli lenses. So then the direct observable of milli lensing uh, are supermassive compact objects uh, which have a um, surface mass density above a certain threshold. That is the one that you have here as anticipated before. And astrophysical objects uh, which satisfy this condition are, for example, as I just mentioned, the, the core of subgalactic dark matter halos uh, that we can find uh, surrounding the galactic halo uh, or free floating, even free floating in the field. But there are also other astrophysical objects that can satisfy this condition, which are, for example, supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies, as the one we find in uh, active galaxies, for example, uh, or even primordial black holes that, as I said before, they are considered by some models um, a major component of the dark matter. Until now, the, the search for these dark matter halos at subgalactic scales uh, has been addressed mostly using what I will call uh, indirect observ observational methods. Um, and I will explain you later why I call them like that. 
So one of them is uh, uh, it makes use of uh, uh, gravitational lensing again, but this time at galactic scales. So, so here the lens is not a, a supermassive compact object, but uh, uh, a galaxy, an entire galaxy itself with, with its own uh, dark matter halos. And, uh, and in this case, you, you may have two different scenarios as you, you have here on the right. So you, you can be in, a, in a, the scenario A where uh, when the, the source in the background is, a, is an extended source, has, for example, another galaxy or, uh, uh, or even a radio loud uh, um, quasar uh, when we can resolve the jet. Uh, in this case, you have the formation of arc-like structures, and in some cases, uh, even the formation of an entire Einstein ring. If instead you are in case B, uh, so the, the, the uh, source in the background is a compact source, then in this case, uh, you have instead the formation of multiple compact sources, uh, as we expect in the case of, uh, of millilensing. But in this case, the angular separation between them is, uh, uh, is larger than, than the milliard second. Uh, the milliard second case is of the order usually of the arc second or, or some arc second, uh, because in this case, the lens is a, is a galaxy. Um, so since uh, um, in, uh, in gravitational lensing, um, both the uh, the position and the magnification of the lens images uh, depends on the um, lens mass distribution, then basically any uh, anomaly on these uh, physical quantities may indicate the presence of an extra mass in the uh, gravitational potential of the lens uh, contributing to the, to the lens. And, uh, and basically, this is the method. So it works with these uh, anomalies and uh, uh, to find the presence of these uh, um, supermassive compact uh, uh, sources. Then there is another method that instead uh, uh, makes use of, uh, um, of density perturbation in, in Milky Way stellar streams, where these stellar stream are, uh, streams are made of, uh, um, of, uh, uh, of stars that are esca escaping uh, disrupting globular clusters. And uh, again, if this stellar stream is uh, encountering another uh, mass, a mass condensate in, 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 uh, in its path between uh, basically the, the stellar mass and, and us, then there can be um, a perturbation in the, in the density of the, of the stellar stream itself. But in this case, in this method is um, is uh, uh, is difficult, for example, to understand if this density perturbation is uh, proper of the of the stellar stream, or is if if it's if it's caused by a, a gravitational lensing event. And then we have uh, uh, another method that still makes use of uh, uh, gravitational lensing, but this uh, uh, time in the uh, in this case in the time domain. Um, so using lens gamma ray burst, um, in this case, we can reach uh, even lower masses for the lens. And uh, in, in this recent paper of Veres and collaborator, for example, they have uh, um, used the two um, emission episodes in this uh, GRB 210812A uh, and the, the time delay and flux ratios between the two events to infer the mass of the, of the lens. So I, uh, as I said before, I call this, uh, um, this method uh, indirect observational method because uh, in, in, in all these cases, uh, it's difficult uh, to understand if uh, what you observe is, uh, is something intrinsic or if it's associated with a gravitational uh, lens event. So then if you want to have a more direct proof that uh, uh, you are really in the in the presence of a gravitational uh, lensing event by a supermassive compact object, then you, you need to, uh, to, to image the two uh, lensed images produced by this uh, uh, supermassive compact object. And since, the, as I said before, the lensed images uh, will be in the milliard second regime, then you need the milliard second resolution. And the, the most direct way that we have nowadays 
to, to reach this high resolution is using the very long baseline uh, interferometric technique. In this uh, technique, uh, antennas located in uh, different places around the world uh, observe all together, effectively using the entire Earth surface as if it was one unique antenna. Um, here I show you just the two uh, main VLBI arrays uh, located in the northern hemisphere because are the one that I'm interested in, uh, which are the European VLBI network with uh, uh, antennas located in uh, Europe, in Asia, and one in South Africa, and then the um, the VLBA uh, which ante uh, with antennas mostly located in uh, in North America. So we have performed. Uh, uh, pilot search for these uh, uh, for these milli lenses. Um, we did it using the uh, publicly available data in the AstroGeo VLBI FITS image database, uh, which contains uh, um, data mostly coming from uh, astrometry, astrometry programs uh, dedicated, dedicated to the completion of a radio fundamental catalog. And this means that uh, most of the sources there are. Uh, compact radio sources uh, observe at multiple frequency and in multiple epochs. At the time we performed this search, we, uh, we downloaded the data for multi-frequency and multi-epoch data for uh, a total of almost 14,000 sources. Then we perform a stacking of uh, the images for those sources where multi-epoch were, uh, were available. And then we finally created the uh, um, a web page for the visual inspection of uh, all images that we produce uh, for, for the old sources. Uh, then using the, um, the idea uh, of, the, uh, of the citizen science project, uh, we involve uh, five PhD scientists and nine undergraduate physics students from the University of Crete to, um, to visually inspect all these sources. And we ask them, to uh, possibly select as uh, uh, millilens candidates uh, those sources uh, uh, that were displaying multiple compact components in at least one observing band, and then possible to, possibly to discard those sources that were instead clearly showing a core jet-like structure, as in the case, uh, in the example you have uh, at the right. Um, then we also insert... Uh, um, uh, 200 mock lenses in the in the sample to to inspect uh, as a sort of uh, of quality check because the the person the people involved uh, people involved in the search were not expert either in uh, in agent physics or gravitational lensing. Um, we created this mock lensing just uh, uh, adding um, fake. Uh, secondary component uh, in uh, in the within the field of view of the uh, of the image of the source, um, and then we found that after this first uh, uh, visual inspection step, uh, eight over these two hundred mock lenses were missing, but fortunately six of them were missed by uh, by two person in particular. So then we respected the, the almost uh, uh, one thousand sources inspected by these two person and then we were finally able to uh, to assess a, a loss rate of uh, roughly one percent for this first uh, uh, visual inspection step uh, and we also find uh, uh, found four more lens candidates then we performed uh, two more uh, uh, steps in this visual inspection where this time instead we uh, we involved uh, um, expert in uh, in either AGN physics or or gravitational lensing uh, in the search, and then we ended up uh, basically with uh, uh, with a sample of uh, fifty nine candidates. Uh, then, as a last uh, um, filter for for our best candidates, we use the uh, surface brightness preservation criterion. So in gravitational lensing, um, there are some physical quantities that, uh, that have to be preserved. And one of them is the, is the surface brightness, uh, which means that uh, a secondary weaker component has to be also smaller than the primary brightest component. So then we finally use uh, 
an apparent surface brightness ratio lower than seven to uh, to select the 40 uh, best uh, millilens candidates from our search. And we published this list um, in this uh, uh, in this letter in monthly notice. Um, here you also have the list of sources, and plus you have an example of uh, of, uh, of some some of the images uh, that you can find in the AstroGeo uh, database for these sources. And that, as you can see, they they display multiple compact component on on millier second scales. So just as a summary, basically all these uh, 40 uh, millilens candidates have uh, multiple compact components uh, in at least one observing band at, uh, in, in millilens second case. And plus they have an apparent surface brightness, brightness ratio uh, between components uh, lower than seven. Then based also in... Uh, uh, on spectral index measurements, we also suggest uh, the, uh, the two most possible millilens candidates. And so why, why this, uh, the, it's important. So the, as I said, as anticipated before, uh, gravitational lensing is an achromatic effect that uh, is, uh, is supposed to, to preserve some, uh, some physical quantities between the two. Uh, lens images. And these quantities are, are this one, the surface brightness, the flux density ratio at the same frequency uh, in, in time, so between epochs, uh, and also the flux density ratio uh, between frequencies that translate into the spectral index. Um, but um, Moreover, the, um, the two light rays producing the two lens images have different paths and this introduces a time delay between the two lensed images. But since this time delay is uh, proportional to the angular separation between the, the lensed images, and uh, in the case of millilensing, we have a very small angular separation, we are in the milliard second regime, then this means that uh, uh, time delays in, in millilensing uh, are very small. They are usually of tens of seconds or hours. And this is uh, very important because it means that uh, uh, flux density uh, ratio measurements or uh, spectral index measurements, uh, um, they are not affected by, by time delays in millilensing. Also, for the, uh, however, for the spectral index measurements, uh, we cannot discard the, the, the possibility that the, uh, the two light rays that have different paths, uh, they are crossing different medium with, uh, with different uh, absorption coefficients uh, that then will lead to, to the two lensed images that have different uh, spectral indexes. And exactly for this reason, then we have used these uh, spectral index measurements just as a suggestion and not to, uh, to filter out more sources. Uh, then it's also important uh, uh, the fact that the, the, the spectra uh, are flat. So here you have uh, uh, an example of a, um, of a well-known uh, gravitational lens system, uh, in this case at uh, uh, Galactic's case. So here the lens uh, is this G1 galaxy plus another dwarf uh, uh, galaxy uh, nearby G2. And uh, they split the image of a, a radio compact quasar in the background into these four uh, images that you have here, A, B, C, and D. Um, so since we know that in a, a radio compact uh, quasar, the bulk of the mission comes from the core, from the core region, and we know that the core region has a flat spectrum, then this means that we expect the, uh, the four lens images to have similar, um, similar spectra, but also to be flat, as it is exactly in this, uh, in this case here. And this, for example, is in, it can be, uh, I mean, it is important, it is an important test um, to, for example, exclude some other uh, sources that, that they may resemble in the, in the morphology what we expect in the case of millilensing. So they may have this, again, this uh, uh, multiple compact component on millier second scales, as it is this uh, case here, but they, they wouldn't pass the test of, of 
of having a similar spectral index and having also uh, flat, spect both uh, flat spectral index, uh, because in this case, for example, here you have uh, um, one component that is the core um, and, and another component is a secondary component along, uh, along the jet. And in this case, we know that the core usually have uh, usually has a flat spect spectrum, but instead the secondary component usually have uh, has a steeper spectrum. Uh, let's say that um, in general, the the steps that uh, we are now performing in this uh, pilot study, and that we will uh, we will also perform in this uh, um, more extended uh, uh, the more extended smile project uh, in order to to finally confirm a milliland system are the following one so we expect we inspect uh, vlbi images in search for uh, sources with multiple compact components on milliard seconds case then uh, we uh, we measure the the surface brightness of these uh, uh, putative lens images and we uh, exclude those sources that have uh, uh, they, that they don't have uh, um, similar um, surface brightness. And then, uh, with more information in our hand, the next step will be to um, to compare also to uh, flux ratio measurements at the same frequency over epoch or spectral index uh, measurement. And for this task, then uh, in, in this case, for our pilot study, uh, we needed uh, um, more uh, information in our hand. So then we uh, we propose and obtain uh, um, time with the with the EVN for follow up observation of our sources uh, that we perform at five and uh, twenty two gigahertz. And then basically, once you have this uh, extra information in your hand, you uh, you restart the loop. Uh, to finally, uh, basically, um, uh, select only those sources that uh, pass all these uh, all these tests, uh, and then for those sources that uh, will pass all tests, um, we will finally uh, test them against the uh, lens uh, models to see if their um, if the position uh, of of their uh, of the lens images and and their uh, Flux ratios co can correspond to a, uh, to a lens model. So, in case uh, mm, let's say that in case we we find uh, uh, any or a milli lens system, since uh, no milli lens system uh, has been found yet, uh, this will be a major discovery for sure. But also, uh, in case we don't find any, um, still the the uh, the rejected sources uh, are not for trashing. They are still uh, uh, very interesting uh, and they, they can be investigated as a possible uh, um, either compact symmetric object or even supermassive binary black hole candidate. Um, the first ones, uh, um, CSO, are uh, considered the young counterparts of uh, the nowadays extended uh, radio galaxies. And in these sources, uh, most of the emission comes from uh, from these uh, lobes. Uh, that is where the um, the terminating part of jet is interacting with uh, uh, interstellar medium. And uh, in in most of the sources, uh, actually the uh, the core, the central engine that is expected to to be located in between these uh, uh, these two lobe emission. Um, low emission, sorry, uh, in most of the cases is, uh, is obscured. And for this reason, the, the, the morphology that you have here is uh, resembling a lot to the one we expect in case of mini lensing. Uh, then here on the right instead, you have uh, the, uh, a multi-frequency uh, VABA Im images of uh, the only um, morphologically confirmed uh, supermassive binary black hole system. And uh, this is interesting because uh, um, based, uh, uh, based on the fact that we, uh, we expect most of the galaxies to have uh, uh, supermassive black holes at their center, um, uh, and based on the hierarchical merging uh, uh, theory, uh, we would expect to see many more of them. 
So as I said before, we for our pilot study, we um, we have obtained uh, time with the with the EVN for the follow-up observation of our 40 millilens candidate uh, that we perform uh, with uh, at the 5 and 22 gigahertz in phase referencing for a total of uh, uh, 140 hours uh, divided into these uh, uh, five observing sessions. Um, the analysis is still undergoing, so I will just show you now some, uh, uh, some results. So this source, for example, uh, J0527 plus 1743, uh, in our new uh, EVN 5 gigahertz observation is uh, still uh, showing these uh, uh, two uh, compact features at mass case. Uh, so the morphology that uh, made us selecting this source as a, a millilens candidate. Um, we were instead able to discard the, the uh, third component visible in the AstroGeo image at uh, 4.3 gigahertz as a possible artifact. And uh, uh, the source is still uh, passing the uh, surface brightness uh, preservation criterion. Uh, but instead, when we measure the flux density ratio um, at the two between the two lens putative lens images at the two closest uh, uh, frequency, uh, we see that we have some discrepancies uh, here. So it's possible that this uh, system is not a, a millilens, um, and, uh, but we still have the 22 gigahertz information to, uh, to say something more. Then here you have another interesting source, J0237 plus 1116. Uh, we think that what plays a role here um, is the variability of this, uh, of this source. Uh, because in the uh, the source was selected because uh, it was showing this uh, uh, double compact feature uh, that instead is not showing anymore in our new um, EVN 5 gigahertz image, uh, where instead we have a more, uh, let's say, um, average uh, core jet uh, morphology. Um, the, so it's possible that in the in the epoch uh, of the astroge observation, the source was ejecting a secondary component along the jet, and uh, and and uh, that has been traveling along the jet, and then uh, it's not visible anymore in our new uh, observation. This uh, scenario of the uh, core jet-like uh, uh, structure is also supported by the astrometric uh, um, position at optical frequencies has uh, uh, obtained by Gaia uh, that locate the, the optical emission very close to the, to the, to the core and uh, not instead in between the two compact component as we would expect in case of a, a millilens system. Uh, then the last uh, source I want to show you is this one, J1143 plus 1834. Uh, in this source, we, we, uh, we detect emission at both 5 and 22 gigahertz from both compact, uh, compact features. Uh, this source, if, uh, if it, at the end we will be discarded as a millilens system, who knows, with a further analysis, is still very interesting to, to be investigated because it was uh, um, Consider uh, it has been considered uh, as a CSO candidate and also as a supermassive binary black hole candidate uh, by previous studies. So then we uh, we plan to perform this uh, exact search on a uh, more extended uh, um, uh, project, the, the the Smile project that has uh, recently received uh, European funding. Uh, in this project, we will perform the similar search, but uh, on a complete sample of almost 5,000 uh, radio loud sources and using LBI observations. And this time we will uh, take care of data uh, from scratch, so from the data calibration. And uh, if there is any radio astronomer in the audience, uh, they, they can easily understand how uh, this, the, the, the task of the, the data reduction of VLBI data is, uh, um, requires some effort. Um, the idea behind this uh, project um, comes from these two pioneering studies. 
uh, first press and gun in 1973, um, they, they find that the, uh, the, the number of gravitational lensing events uh, by supermassive compact object uh, directly probes the, uh, the mass density, therefore the abundance of these supermassive compact object in the universe. And then later on, Wilkinson et al. in 2001 used this idea to constrain the abundance of these supermassive compact object in the universe uh, with masses between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 8 solar massing, masses using a sample of roughly 300 sources and VLBI data. And this is the constraint that you have here that they infer, we infer with no millilens uh, detected. With our SMILE project, we, um, we will constrain instead the uh, abundance of uh, supermassive compact objects with masses between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 9 solar masses with more than an order of magnitude better precision than in Wilkinson et al. 2001. Um, in, uh, in this plot here, you have uh, the, uh, the density of the universe uh, locked up in in uh, object of a certain mass versus that mass, and uh, um, as you can see, the the constraint that we will obtain with our project uh, will be below the the lambda CDM prediction. While this was instead not the case for Wilkinson et al. 2001, just because of the size of the sample. So, and then since the, uh, the goal of our project is uh, to estimate the abundance of supermassive compact objects in the universe with roughly 16 times better precision than in previous studies, then we have to, to move to a sample that is roughly 16 times larger than uh, the ones in previous studies. And then because of that, we... Uh, we uh, consider the uh, original uh, catalog in, in class, uh, being class uh, the Cosmic Lens or Sky Survey, the most successful to date uh, search for gravitational lens system at galactic scales uh, using radio frequencies. So we use the original class catalog um, and uh, we, uh, we selected the, those sources uh, which have uh, uh, total flux density at 8 gigahertz uh, above uh, 50 millijansky, and then we ended up with uh, almost uh, uh, 5,000 sources. Here you have the selection criteria also used by, uh, by class for, uh, for their uh, original sample that obviously are the same uh, in, in our SMILE sample. And you also have the, the SMILE sample distribution here on the right. Um, then since we, we, we need uh, VLBI data for, for all these uh, almost 5,000 sources, we cross-match our uh, SMILE sample with the uh, data in the NRAO archive. And we found that uh, uh, roughly 75% of, of our sources uh, were already there. Uh, and then we ask and obtain a um, uh, new observation for the remaining 25 uh, sources uh, that were performed with the uh, new VLBI uh, receiver in, in, uh, at C-band that allows uh, uh, observation at the same time at these uh, two frequencies here. But so since uh, the, so the direct observable of a smile will be the abundance of these supermassive compact objects in the universe, but we are interested actually in a particular type of supermassive compact object, which are these dark matter halos at subgalactic scale, then what exactly we want to know is the, the, the number that we expect, uh, um, the, 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 the number of dark matter halos at subgalactic scales that we expect uh, to, uh, to have within our SMILE uh, search. And this obviously depends on the, uh, both the density profiles of dark matter halos as well as on the mass function of dark matter halos, which in turn depends on the uh, dark matter particle properties. And then it also depends on the, uh, partially on the uh, experiment, in particular on the uh, sample size and uh, uh, and again, a SMILE will have the largest sample ever for this type of search. So uh, then in order to constrain uh, these uh, uh, 
uh, this number here, we uh, computed the optical depth uh, for all the sources in our sample, where the optical depth is the probability of a source at a certain redshift of being uh, gravitationally lensed by, by an object uh, along the path. So this depends on the redshift of the source, obviously, and then we uh, we have uh, the redshift information for almost, uh, for roughly two thirds of, uh, uh, of smile sources. And for the remaining one third of sources, we instead consider a similar uh, redshift distribution. Um, this optical depth here depends on the number density uh, of, uh, of our lenses, uh, which are these uh, dark matter ages of subgalactic case. Uh, though, so it, uh, as I said before, then it depends on the, um, density profiles and the and the mass function and this is the parameter that is different actually for different dark matter models then it also depends on this uh, uh, on the lens in cross section that in turn depends on the uh, mass of the lens and of the on the redshift of the lens and on the source and then it finally depends on the uh, on this uh, uh, lens path that uh, instead uh, it's uh, in turn is defined by the by the cosmology used and by the redshift of the source. So then once we computed the optical depth for each one of the source in our, in our sample, we just sum up these, uh, uh, these quantities and we obtained the, uh, the number of dark matter halos, a subgalactic case that we expected to detect through mini lensing. And this is what we, what we computed for, um, for just for some uh, uh, as an example for some uh, um, dark matter models. So we, we expect to have uh, uh, zero millilens if the warm dark matter model is the, is the correct one, just because of the cutoff at around uh, 10 to the 8 solar masses that I show you at the, at the very beginning of the presentation. And then we computed this uh, number also for three uh, Called the dark matter models with uh, uh, different uh, uh, density profiles. In uh, in two of them, uh, the density profiles come from uh, um, from n body simulations and from uh, uh, theoretical expectation. And instead, in one of them, uh, we used uh, uh, a density profile that we derived from uh, observation of galaxy cluster. The important thing here, what you have to notice, is that uh, we have quite different numbers for different dark matter models. And this leads to the natural conclusion that then SMILE will allow us to robustly discard some of the uh, currently viable dark matter models. And if we compare this with, uh, with the previous studies, uh, this was not possible in the past just because of the sample size. So since, uh, for example, the uh, the sample in Wilkinson et al. and the sample in SMILE have a similar ratio distribution, then we can use this formula here to uh, obtain the same uh, expectation number for the study in Wilkinson et al. Um, in comparison with the number that we obtain here for the SMILE project. And, um, and if we use this formula here at the bottom, we obtain that in Wilkinson et al. Um, we have zero for all these uh, uh, different dark matter models, which, mean that that, which means that just because of the sample size, uh, Wilkinson et al. was not able to, uh, to constrain, uh, to, to distinguish between these uh, dark matter models. So now let me just briefly advertise the um, two postdoctoral and uh, two PhD student positions that uh, we will open soon. To, uh, to work in this uh, uh, exciting project. Um, it's, uh, um, we, we prefer candidates uh, uh, with, uh, with some expertise in, uh, um, in the LBI radio data and, uh, and also in, uh, in programming because we will try to, we have to obviously automatize, automatize the, the, the process of the LBI data reduction, but uh, please, in any case, if you are interested, uh, just uh, uh, have a look at these uh, two uh, pages, uh, web pages for more information and send me an email. And now I would like to, so to use some, uh, some few uh, more minutes, um, so I've, I've been asked to, uh, to give you some, uh, um, some tips uh, 
uh, for to write a successful uh, ERC proposal. Um, but uh, fortunately for me, and uh, unfortunately for maybe for this tip, uh, um, uh, this was the, the first time for me uh, that uh, that I applied and uh, I um, I succeed. Um, so uh, I don't have uh, uh, any basically term of comparison uh, of, of bad experiences so to uh, to to give you really uh, probably useful uh, um, suggestion uh, but I can still um, tell you about uh, a little bit about my my experience and uh, what at least was useful for me in the in the process so it's um, uh, I found uh, um, I mean, I was I was honestly scared a little bit at the beginning um, before starting writing the proposal because uh, I thought that I didn't have a, a, a project strong enough. Uh, but I got this good suggestion of of start writing, and uh, and and that was a good suggestion because sometimes uh, good ideas uh, comes in the process, and that was exactly what what happened to me. Uh, good ideas came from uh, from from my side and from my collaborators so that leads to the other actually um, suggestion that I have to give you that uh, um, so don't don't uh, to to try to um, to build a good a good team maybe um, to to support your to you support your project um, you can get uh, very good uh, uh, feedback very good input and at the same time, uh, so it's uh, if you uh, obviously look for people uh, who have experience in the in the ERC process. Uh, so in, in this case, in my case, my two supervisor supervisors here uh, have this type of experience, so it was very useful for me. Um, it's uh, it's really important, so they can polish your proposal. They can give you important input uh, for uh, to prepare your interview. So. Uh, try to, uh, to uh, recruit uh, people at least to make them reading your proposal and to give you some uh, good input. And uh, then another uh, good suggestion that was given to me and that I found very useful, it was to start writing uh, uh, the, the proposal from part B1, that is the shortest one, but is basically your pass for the second stage. So uh, the risk is that you uh, once you have, if you start writing B2, then you are kind of tired in writing and then the, uh, the B1 part uh, is not so appealing. Instead, it's the, the, the B1 part that is the, the most important one. And then the, uh, the I know it's, uh, this may sound uh, silly uh, because obviously there is a lot of pressure, a lot of stress when you, you have just 10 minutes to present your your uh, project and to to turn upside down your career because this is what it is mostly if you are a young researcher but um but it it, it is what it is you have to try to to enjoy uh, while giving your presentation because this will also help you to uh, to communicate your science in the best possible way to uh, to show uh, your enthusiasm for the project and, uh, and not to feel so so nervous by the situation. Um, and then finally, what uh, is remain, what I can uh, just uh, show you, I hope this is legal actually, um, is um, some of the good positive feedbacks I, I got from the, uh, from the reviewers. Um, that they uh, they apply to my uh, project, but I think they may apply to uh, in general to, to many more projects. So uh, what they they have appreciated is the fact that I had a pilot study uh, supporting the feasibility of the project. So keep this in mind. Then they also appreciated the fact that uh, I I built I I recruited expert because this this project actually is touching different fields. Uh, and, and they appreciated the fact that I built, uh, I recruited the expert for this uh, uh, to, to, uh, to make a team for in support of this project with different expertise touching the different field uh, of the project. 
Um, then uh, um, obviously you have to try to write your the, the methodology and also to as clear as possible and also to properly assess uh, uh, risks. This is very important. And and then at the end, uh, so there is this voice uh, that you can you can see in the one of the voice that that is used for. Um, for, for to, to judge your proposal is this uh, uh, high risk high gain um, okay high risk high gain is uh, is very very sexy um, but I think it's even even uh, uh, sexier if uh, mostly if you are a young researcher with not much experience um, if your your project is actually uh, high gain and low risk so try really to to minimize as much as possible the uh, the risk and that's it i think i i can stop here so thanks for your attention Okay, thank you, Carolina. It has been really uh, interesting. Your your speech really, I, I love uh, everything because I, I'm enthusiast of these uh, dark matter models. In fact, uh, is one of my subjects of study, so I enjoy very much your talk. So I have a, a couple of questions. Perdona, Maria Angeles, no te estamos oyendo. No. Okay. Oh, sí. Try. I, I, I don't know. Do you hear me? I was hearing Maria. Really Sorry, Maria Angeles, everything was okay. Go ahead. Okay, okay, okay. So I have a couple of questions for you. Um, this one is uh, from uh, Mr. Gallego, Mr. Gallego. His question is about it. Well, have you considered observing the candidates, uh, these candidates with the GTC telescope at the La Palma Observatory? Is it possible to do it? What do you think? What do you, can you tell us about that? With optical observation? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, unless we have, we use uh, uh, adaptive optics, uh, we cannot reach similar milliard second resolution. And this is what we, it's extremely important in, um, for this project, uh, what we, we just need is this milliard second resolution. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm just reading other questions. Yes. I mean, uh, this, this is, sorry, just, just to, as a yeah. further clarification, maybe this was also to, in order to, um, yeah, I don't know uh, at, at which stage uh, this, uh, this observation, uh, um, so it's, uh, I mean, for the search, we need millisecond second resolution, but obviously then for the follow-up, uh, we, we want to, uh, to collect um, as more information as possible on the, uh, on the lens. So then we will obviously also try to, to look for the optical counterpart. Is this was what uh, uh, the, the question was about. So, yeah. so uh, well, I imagine if, uh, if uh, you want to know exactly what's the candidate, you will need this, this big uh, telescopes as, as GTC. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Then we once we have uh, finally the our best, really best. Uh, so the uh, once uh, all possible uh, VLBI observation has helped us in in discarding and uh, all all uh, candidates and filtering only the, the very best one. Then we will obviously start uh, whatever type of uh, of follow up at uh, at multi frequency because then it's important to collect information. And yeah, this yeah. may. One yes, uh, Dr. Gallego is telling us that DTC is now going to install the new, a new instrument called FRIDA, which considers adapted of this, so probably it could be a good candidate uh, for your observations in the future. Interesting, I didn't know. Yeah. Uh, I have here another question, let me see. Jorge Sanchez Almeida want to know, why do you expect more detection if core self-interactive dark matter profiles rather than if, uh, than if the profiles are CASPI? Uh, Navarro friend and white profiles. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. This is a, a very good question. So, um, because CAS profile um, tended to, to, to infinity, basically the density, but at zero. So, at, uh, like you don't have any extension, basically, you don't have any region that is, uh, uh, is making you, uh, is making the, the lensing. So, we, we are the, the, the we are very much interested, obviously, in the, um, the either the concentration or, or the density of this uh, innermost region, but also that has uh, some extension um, that can is what the, these more core-like uh, uh, center are giving us instead of the cusp-like center, um, because we still have a range of uh, possible masses for our. For our lens system. So we are still probing lenses with masses between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 9 solar masses. So the, the problem is to, to know so what, what type, uh, what is the, the corresponding mass in the, in the dark matter uh, halos. That, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, let me read another question. Yes, Alex, well, it's a question about proposals. And uh, would you recommend to show some sort of computer simulation, if possible, supporting your project? Um, this particular project, this one? I, I guess so, yeah. Um, OK, for, for this proof of concept, we really don't, didn't need. Uh, it was enough with what we uh, we we provided uh, in the because it's for us the um yeah i mean it was uh, uh, in principle in this project actually we can um, we, we are much we are very interested if if uh, if people come to us with their own uh, density profiles with with their own favorite dark matter models and uh, and they provide us with a density profile and with a, a mass function and then we can basically um uh, compute again our estimate number using this new input uh, and then uh, uh, obtain uh, what uh, an expected number. So it's uh, um, in this particular case, just uh, we, we can uh, uh, get uh, basically um, inputs from uh, embody simulation or other uh, expectation from, from people. And uh, it was not really needed from us to, to, to compute this or. Okay. Well, I have a question. Is well, I've seen in your in your uh, statistics about the the number of events you you are expecting that maybe you could not um, distinguish between two models. In that case, depending on the number you obtain in your project, what's what could should be the next uh, um, step in 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 the research in in this uh, subject? What do you think? Uh, since the, um, the 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 sensitivity uh, in your constraint increases with the with the size of sample with the sample size sorry the next step will will be just to move to even a farther uh, to to even a, a a bigger sample to try to to reach better and better sensitivity. Do you think that the collaboration with another, with another kind of experiments uh, looking for this uh, dark matter uh, halos could be possible? I mean, probably using different experiments, we could we 
could uh, um, distinguish between the different uh, models. I mean, I'm thinking about, for instance, the, the stellar streams or, or something like that, the, the, the morphology of the stellar streams and trying to, to look if they are uh, compatible, the, the results in both experiments. Uh, I guess so. Uh, I guess so. I don't. I don't know much about this uh, stellar stream. The, the statistic they can get, for example, I mean stellar stream. They, uh, I think there is just only one very good candidate, for example, because uh, as I said uh, uh, in, during my presentation, is uh, in, in all these uh, uh, indirect method uh, is extremely difficult to have evidence that uh, what we are seeing is, uh, is uh, not intrinsic, uh, but is given by a gravitational lensing event. So I think what's, what uh, matters is the statistic here. And, um, and our project will, uh, will provide the, the, the largest sample so far for this type of search. And uh, this, what, this, this is what will allow us to finally have some good statistics. Okay, maybe we should uh, talk in the future and collaborate in some way. <laughs> that would be nice. Okay, if, uh, I think we don't have any more questions, so I want to thank you again. Very nice talk. I enjoy a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Caroline. Bye. Bye.